Good day, folks. Today we're back here on the wood chipper again, doing a bit of updates and uh, where we're currently at, and uh, basically just sharing information on what I have and what I've what I've seen and what I've found out and uh, that sort of stuff. A brief summary of where we're at and or where the journey is so far is that. Woodland has sent had sent me new blades, new uh, anvil, um, a new PTO shaft. The thing, the reason they sent me blades was because the one of the blades broke, and then took out all the blades. And also, it actually, I f after changing it out, I found it cracked the anvil. Almost in half, not quite though. And then in the last video, I put on the new PTO shaft and it uh, did the exact same thing as it always did. So nothing's changed in that regard. Down, buddy. Um, where I'm currently at is, so when I installed the anvil, I installed it eighth inch off the, uh, the blade. Not eighth inch, sorry, one sixteenth. And that uh, was to, um, I, I wanted to try and close up the clearances a little bit to the minimum that's in the, in the manual. Stop it. Stop. It was in the manual to see if that would have any sort of effect. I, I kind of felt it wouldn't since it's not how it works. It's not like a pair of scissors where clearance matters. It, it, it's not like that. It's just... Basically, it's a lever, so if you have a lever here and you hit it out here, it's easier to cant the wood. Whereas if your lever's back here and you hit it here, it's really challenging to make the wood kick. So it's kind of a, it's not really having anything to do with, with the bite of, a, of the wood at all. So how I set that is I use, so what we, what we had back in the day for, measure, for making threads, well, um, when cutting threads is we had they're they're called the uh, and how that works as well it's it's actually quite a kind of an interesting thing so when you're cutting the threads you go through the pitch on what thread per inch you're doing or metric and then you would find the the right thread that you're cutting and then you'd find the right wire in comparison and then you would add the overall width. So you'd take three wires and stack them kind of like this and then throw your mic over the overall dimension and measure this width. So yeah, that's kind of a long, well, I haven't done that for quite a while, but anyways, I have these. So they're, they're what they are is they're precision ground uh, rods, drill rod. So I had used a, a 62 or 63 thou, which is half a thou thicker than a 16th, and set it up. Set up the anvil um, from the from the blade clearance down. You sneak into the end of the chute and you kind of run your little your little width and that's what I use there so obviously that's better than a tape measure having not very many people would have um, this sort of precision type instrument to measure stuff but I so happen to have it so I did it and Anyways, what ended up happening from that situation is that my blades on the furthest point of deflection all ended up kissing the anvil when being used. Now it didn't destroy the blades, but they'll definitely need addressed. And I'll bring you over closer to what's going on a bit. Now, if you look here, 
you can see that the blade goes below the anvil lowest point which is this thing so it swings below and I'll bring you over to the sight window so you gotta you can see how the blade goes lower and over here you can see it's hard to get in here So you can see it's it's still sharp up in here and then to where it passed by the anvil it rounded off the edge it's a little maybe you can see it from this angle smacked the little corners off so it's sharpenable but certainly not ideal so then that kind of raised the question of if I'm within spec, how can how can that have happened? And it's only um, there's really only one way of it happening, and that's the flywheel moves closer to the to the anvil. Now it doesn't seem to be. I've checked the the uh, forward and back with on the bearing and it does seem okay that way but we do have an, I'll do a test here so here I'm gonna just try and bring the take all the tolerance up in this way You can feel it kind of shift. So it's 15th thou in resting position. Let's see how much it'll move. hard to get a good solid purchase on this thing here. So there we have about 18 thou, which is one third of the clearance. And then that's not counting any deflection. So these will be pulling hard in this direction here. So let's reset it into its back position. So we're back within half a thou from where we started. Now here, what I'm gonna simulate is when a chip is being chipped and pulling in this direction. So I'm gonna apply pressure on the outside edge where there's going to be the most amount of pull from the chipping operation. Here we go. So by doing that, 
I'm replicating the side load that this will actually be under. So as it chips, it gets pulled every time it every time it would hit the wood, it would ram it. So obviously if it hit after being offset 60 some thou, it's going to, it, it obviously has that much movement in it. So when I, just kind of a quick summary of those measurements, I loaded it this way back here and this way and I had a movement of 18 thou and then I also did a, a test to see how how much uh, flex there is on the outmost portion and we had upwards to 70 thou of, of movement if we wanted it depending on the force obviously everything's going to move a bit but so as for that information and what it means I don't really know what to tell you other than it's probably not wise to set your anvil at 16 thou off um, I don't know what else, what it, it didn't really, it's kind of a different ish issue than the one we've been fighting with, and that's the too aggressive nature of its, of its chipping. So I'll probably just compile this little data package of measurements. I don't know if I can measure, might be able to. I'm going to see how much it, the blade sticks out, 100 thou, 200 thou, 220, so the blade is sticking out at the cutting edge, is sticking out 200 and 25, 230 thou off the face plate. That would be a number that I guess you could compare to the drawings. There's one other issue that I'm kind of hesitant to even mention because it just sort of seemed like it was starting but I didn't quite know what was going on or, or what could have been happening. And that was, I feel, I feel like the hydraulic motor might be going or gone. But I don't know, I don't have too much information to share on that yet. It was, it seemed like it was requiring 400 PSI to even start rolling under no pressure. The speed the flow was fluctuating quite a bit without actually touching the valve switch was leading me to believe that if the flow if the rotation speed was changing that radically based on pressure that it's it's by it's it's bypassing the the parts on the pump but I want to test the further on that before I speak too in depth on that. Anyways, that's all I got to share for now. Kind of just talking it out loud kind of helps, I guess, know what to say about it and go from there. Anyways, now you know where I am at. Bye for now.